You either use the internet for fun or you use the internet to grow. You're here to grow. Welcome to TRS Clips. The first time a lot of us hear about demigods or these kind of pagan practices while we're growing up where we read about Poseidon and the Greeks praying to Poseidon etc you kind of laugh at it a little bit as a child maybe as a child you're fascinated and then your parents and your relatives and your elders make you laugh at it saying that oh this is so old world but there's probably some kind of consciousness that the ocean has that the Greeks of that time called Poseidon that the Indians called Varuna there's some kind of consciousness that the sun also has that we call Surya and other cultures called Ra, etc, etc. What do you think changes when you pray to the gods of these natural things around us? Do you think that if you pray to Surya Dev, your relationship with the sun changes? Or similarly, Poseidon? I, I hope so. I hope, I hope it, that if you pray to Surya Dev, then your relationship to the sun externally... And to the sun internally, which, of course, on the one hand is your right nostril. That's the Surya Nadi. On the one hand is your heart. That also is the Surya because it's the, if you don't have that, the, the rest of your organism, the rest of the solar system is gone. But, but in addition to that, there, is the, there are the other aspects of Surya. So it's you, you, if, if you're really aligning yourself with Surya, then, then ideally what you are doing is you are aligning so yourself with, with all of these aspects, maybe one aspect more than another. Okay. And I mean, if we, for example, we look back into uh, the um, Ramayana for a moment, Rama was from the solar dynasty. That means theoretically his, uh, one of his forebear, one of his ancestors was actually the sun. But when it came time that he needed to prepare himself to encounter Ravana, Vasishta introduced to him the Aditya Hridayam, which is a stotra, a, a, a prayer about, the, about Aditya, about Surya, about the sun. So even, even an avatara like Rama needed to have needed to embody, in order to do what he needed to do, he needed to embody the sun. He could embody the sun because he was in that uh, parampara, in that lineage. So there was the, the potential was already there. It was, uh, the sun was his, ultimately his kula devata, his family deity. But he needed something to activate that in himself so that he could then proceed ahead to do what he needed to do. So, this is be this is happening all around the world in different ways. What's the thing? The difference with India is that people have been doing this for much. There are two two main differences. They've been doing it much longer. They've been doing it in so many different ways. Like in Hawaii, you know, there's there there are a lot of interesting stories about the gods it's, and the goddesses, etc. But but it's one set of gods and goddesses basically. Over here, there's all kinds. There's the Vedic gods, and there's the Puranic gods, and there's local gods. You know, there, there are gods in places that it just for one little area. Because in the past, people were not, people, you would usually worship your Grama Devata. Every little, every Grama, every village or town had a Devata connected to it. And that's who you'd worship in addition to your Kula Devata, your family deity, and your Ishta Devata, the deity that you personally had the biggest affinity with. So things are, you know, the difference here in India is things are much more developed. That's one difference. And the second difference is since the past two or 3,000 years, a lot of the a lot of the the Grama Devatas, these are, you know, we could we could call them demigods, yakshas and yakshinis and so on. What is a devata after all? Let's say that, you know, Hanu, we talk about Hanuman as the god is the, the the son of the god of wind. So it's the 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 wind has a reality. We acknowledge that it has a reality, like the sea. And if you are like the Rishis and the Munis, if you sit and meditate long enough, you will start to perceive that the very fact of it having a reality 
causes it to have some consciousness of its own. Because the entire world is made out of consciousness. This is the, the, the big difference. The Sankhya philosophy and modern physics say the same thing. There was a singularity, it exploded, and now we have the universe, the samsara. The difference is, the modern physics says, it was, it was all energy and it, was, um, it, was, and it turned into matter. And consciousness somehow came out of that, we don't know how. And the Sankhya philosophy here in India says, that's insane to think that way. It was consciousness that started off first with no limitations whatsoever. Neti, neti, iti. It is not this. We can't describe it in any way. It's pure consciousness. But for some reason, it wanted to experience itself. And then as the consciousness became more and more obstructed in the way that the Sankhya explains it, it's become more and more condensed and it's come down to where we are now. <laughs> to our little low level. Our very low level. As it says in the Srimad Bhagavata, this is the lowest, you know, as a, 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 you can't get any more dense than the earth element. It also says that, you know, once you're here, the good news is you only have up to go. You only have up to go. If you were, I mean, you, you, can certainly, you can certainly make a bigger problem for yourself here in the earth element and get into the kitchard, into the mud, and <laughs> be there for quite a while. But if you establish yourself health, with a healthy relationship to the earth element, automatically you'll start moving in the direction of the sky. New clips released at the same time that a podcast releases. This is TRS Clips. Make sure you subscribe.